Welcome to this lesson. I really look forward to share this word with you today. Today I'm going to talk about something I really have on my heart. I'm going to talk about the church. I'm going to talk about the reformation we need to see of the church. Because the church today is so different from what Jesus came with. If I very short take you through some church history, then I can say that the church Jesus came with was like a fellowship of believers. It was like a movement. It was a living body. But then it came to Greece and became a philosophy. Then it came to Italy and became an institution. And it came to the rest of Europe and became a culture. And it came to America and became a business, a enterprise. So it started as a body. A living body, but it ended up becoming a business. But this is prostitution if we make a business out of a body. And what I'm going to share today is going to provoke many, it's going to shock many, but it's also going to show what the church is all about. And it's going to set many people free so we can be the church we read about in the book of Acts, be the church God want us to be. So God bless you and I believe that this teaching will open your eyes and help you and be a blessing for many of you. Welcome to the Pioneer School and welcome to lesson 17. I really look forward to share this with you today and the next time where we are going to end up the Pioneer School and look at something that is really on my heart because this is an area where I have been set free. <laughs> an area where we have seen many people set free because we're going to look at the structure. We're going to look at what church is. Uh, my ministry, my website it is called The Last Reformation and uh, one of my books is also called The Last Reformation. And in this book I'm looking at the structure, why we do church the way we do it and that the way we do church today is not biblical in many areas and it don't produce disciples. And I have been looking forward to talking about this since we started with the Pioneer School. But I have on to now tried to layer foundation and try to look at some of the other things that have been changed through the history when it comes to theology. I can just go through what I've been speaking about on to now. I have like an overview here. I started with an intro. <laughs> the first two lessons I talk about coming out of the box where I talked about church history, the first lesson, and then I talk about religion contra what Jesus came with. So those two lessons were somehow our in intro to what I want to give in the Pioneer School. Then I talked lesson three about the book of Acts, how the book of Acts is the normal Christian life. And then I came with something really important before we are going to start. This is the, the difference between knowledge and obedience, that we have a lot of knowledge today but almost no obedience. And it's so important with everything we do that we should not end up with only theology or only knowledge. No. Jesus said something to us, not that we should be smart. It's okay to be smart. It's okay to learn something new. But when he said something to us, he said it because he wants us to do it. And it was what I talked about there. And then there was four lessons where I talked about healing and preaching, where we looked at the healing and preaching and kickstarting and, and how to preach the gospel. 
After that, there was four lessons where it was somehow a foundation when it comes to salvation, where we look at repentance, baptism in water, and baptism with the Holy Spirit. And then after that, I have one lesson where I talk about knowing God, a strong life with God. And in that area, it was lesson uh, 13 where I talk about fasting. And then I have used three lessons talking about who is God, where I've just been speaking about God is holy, loving, how this is the new old covenant, and how we are living in the new covenant, and we are free from the law, free to live by the Spirit. And this is what God has laid in my heart to speak about unto now. And, and I didn't know from the beginning what I was going to speak about, but every time I, God gave me something new, I was going to speak about. And the last three lessons, or four lessons, I'm going to look at the reformation of the structure. I'm going to help you and give you a platform to live this life out. Live it out in everyday life. Help you to bear fruit. Help you to see people safe. Help you to live what we have learned unto now. And this is what I'm going to look at the next three times. And the last time I'm going to end up the Pioneer School and, and give you a challenge, give you something you should do in the future. And I really look forward to that. So this is some of the things I've been speaking about onto now. If we just very short go through the church history, uh, for people who don't remember that, in the book of Acts, we have revival Christianity. <laughs> We have what Jesus came with. And this is what I know many of you is longing for. The life. Not just coming in church, sitting and listening to a sermon in a meeting. But living the life we read in the book of Acts. It was a life led by the Holy Spirit. It was a life healing the sick, casting out demons. It was also a life with persecution. But a life where the church was growing and it was living. But then in year 300 we got got the Catholic Church, and during the Catholic Church, we saw many things got changed. We, uh, yeah, it's like everything got changed almost. But then later God started to renew, renew the church back to what we see in the book of Acts. And the first thing he came with was the Reformation, where Martin Luther came with justification by faith something that got changed during the Catholic Church. But Martin Luther didn't reform the Catholic Church back to the Book of Acts. No, he only made a few changes here and there. So he didn't change it back with the biblical baptism of believers. So after that, God needed to do something new, and we got the Baptist revival, where there came the biblical baptism again, on your own faith, under water. Something that have got changed during the Catholic Church, and something Martin Luther didn't reform back. But since that, new things started, because they didn't reform it back. So we got the Methodist sanctification by faith, the Adventist movement, the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Again, something we read in the Bible, in the book of Acts, people got filled with the Holy Spirit. They got baptized with the Holy Spirit. And as you have seen, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the whole sign of the new covenant, that God will pour out His Spirit on all flesh, and that God will give us a new heart and a new spirit. And, and it was what Jesus came with. But baptism of the Holy Spirit got lost during the Catholic Church. And the Luther Church... Today, they don't have it, and many other churches don't build on that foundation. <laughs> so we have that, and the gift of the Holy Spirit, and the fivefold ministry. And if we look at church history, we have seen that God is starting to renew His church. And uh, some of the things I've been speaking about during the Pioneer School is some of the things that have been lost during church history. If you had a Lutheran background, some of the things I would say would really provoke you. If you have a Methodist background, there is other things that will provoke you. If you have a Baptist background, there is other things that will provoke you. 
And this is different from person to person where you get provoked. It depends on which background you have. But what I'm going to talk about now and the next time, I believe is going to provoke many of you, no matter which background you have. Because if you look through church history, it's so clear that God is renewing his church. And, it's, oh, and it was what I talked about the first lesson. And it's also so clear that many of the, when it comes to doctrines that have been lost through the Catholic Church, have been renewed again in some area. Like justification by faith, believers baptism, sanctification by faith, baptism with the Holy Spirit, and so on and so on. So many of the things that have been lost as really important have been renewed again. But there is one thing we really need to see a reformation of. And this is what my book, The Last Reformation, is talking about. This is the structure, the way we do church. Because if you look through church history and look at the way we do church, there is almost nothing that has been changed. What came in in the Catholic Church have almost not been changed today. Everybody still look at church like a building. Everybody still have a worship meetings that is put up in the same order. Everybody almost have like Sunday meeting, there is one who have uh, Saturday here. But everything looks so much the same. If you go to a Catholic Church and look at the building and what they do and how the church look, and then look, go to a Lutheran church, they look almost the same. It's almost the same. There is almost nothing that has been changed. And you can go to a Baptist church and Methodist church, and you also, also see much of the same. The church building, the way it is, the way the meeting is put up, the way with the platform and the pews and, and the priest and communing, and everything almost looks the same but it looks so totally different from what we read in the book of Acts. They didn't have a church building the way we have it. They didn't have a pew with rows the way we have it. They didn't have a small bread and small wine or, or something as communing the way we have it. They didn't have a priest and a sermon the way we have it. They didn't have much of what we have. They did it very different. But it still grew and it was still the church. And this is what I want to look at now. I want to look at what church is. And this time, this lesson is somehow an introduction, what I'm going to speak about the next days. And I want to start with this paper here. This is a quote I have in my book, The Last Reformation. And I really love this. This is amazing because this shows so much. Christianity started out in Israel as a fellowship. So Christianity started in Israel as a fellowship. It started as a fellowship, living fellowship of people who came together. Or I can also use another word, it started as a movement. A movement that grows explosive. Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God. That the kingdom of God was going to be spread all over the place. He was talking about a kingdom. The kingdom of God was a movement. So Christianity started out in Israel as a fellowship or as a movement. Then it moved to Greece and became a philosophy. Then it moved to Italy and became an institution. And then it moved to Europe and became a culture. And it came to America and became a enterprise. And here you see so clear the journey Christianity has been on. It started as a fellowship, as a movement. A living body, a living fellowship of believers where two and three are together. I'm in the midst of you, Jesus said. They came together 
with the headship of Jesus Christ. But then it became a philosophy. And for many people, they still see Christianity as a philosophy. Then it came to Italy and became an institution. And we can see that the Catholic Church is really an institution. It's, it's a big institution. And then it came to Europe and became a culture. And then it came to America and became an enterprise. Just look at the Christian TV today. It's an enterprise. It's a company. But the sad thing is, if you take a, fill, a body, the Church of God is a body. If you take a body and make an enterprise out of a body, a company out of a body, this is prostitution. And we have prostituted the body of Christ because we have made that to our enterprise. And I know it's, it's really strong words and something we have to think of. And uh, this is what I, I have written in the, in the back of my book. That we have made the body of Christ out as a prostitute, as an enterprise. And we try to sell it and, and make it as a company. But it's not like that. And Jesus is not going to come back and get a whore. He's going to come back and get a holy bride. And I believe that what is happening right now is that a new reformation is starting. And this is big and it's growing explosive all over the world. A new reformation is starting where we are going to, re God is going to reform the church or take people out of the church out of that enterprise, out of that philosophy, out of that culture. Take it out. Take people out of that. And then make a new church with those people. And work with those people. And it's so interesting because I see a movement all over the place today where people are tired of church, tired of just coming in church and tired of seeing what they are seeing happening with the church today because they love Jesus and they want to live the real life. And those people come out of this and want this and start to live the way I've been speaking about in the Pioneer School. But at the same time, I'm seeing a growth in the false movement where people are not coming out of that system and coming back to the fellowship, coming back to what Jesus came with, but instead they are going back to the Catholic Church. And I see it so much now, it's so crazy. We in, in Scandinavia, the country we are living in, one of the leaders in the biggest church in Scandinavia, one of the apostles, people, one who have started a lot of good things during the years, he had just a few weeks ago converted to the Catholic Church. Now he's a Catholic. And everybody's talking about it in these countries where we are living. How, what is happening if you have asked him five years ago, do you want to be a Catholic? No, 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 no. I will not. Of course not. But slowly something has come in crept into the church, a mindset, a system. So instead of going back to the freedom we read in the book of Acts, they're going back to the system, to the Catholic Church. And we are seeing it. And I believe that like every movement in the beginning here, they experience a big persecution for the, from the Catholic Church. Every true believer through the history have experienced a big persecution. Many who have experienced persecution have experienced that persecution come from the Catholic Church. They have so much blood on their hands, that system. So many people have died through the history. And I believe that one of the, some of the persecution we are going to experience in the future it's not only going to come as many people think from the Muslims, no. It's going to come from that system. Because under this, they're going to make a new world religion. 
uh, uh, something that looks so good, but it's not the book of Acts. It's not the living church that Jesus came with. So this is just some of the things. So it started as a body, living body, a fellowship, but it became an enterprise. It became something it should never become. And uh, today I'm going to uh, take you through our journey. I'm going to give you some tools and then I'm going to continue building on that the next time. And I want to say that during the pioneer school, I have had my religious classes here because some of the things I've been teaching have been difficult for many of you because of the background. When we talk about the religious classes, what I'm going to share the next time, today and the next time, is the stro most stronghold I have experienced when it comes to religious classes. And for me to have taken those glasses off have been a long, long journey and it has been hard. And if you have been provoked on to now, I believe many is going to be provoked the next three, four times at the Pioneer School. I'm going to say something that's going to go so much against much of what many people have learned. And it's going to provoke many of you. It's going to create a a fight inside of you. It did in my life some years ago when God started to take us through a journey and get us out of the church culture and show us what church was. It was a fight. It was a battle. It was really, really hard. But there was a freedom when we came out. There was a freedom that was so exciting and everything we experienced today somehow built on also this. But I just want to say from the beginning, I'm going to say something the next days, the next time that's going to provoke you. It's going to go against a lot of things. And I want to encourage you to just look in the Bible, see if this is not true and feel what the Holy Spirit is saying to you. And I also want to say from the beginning, I'm not against the church. It can sound, sound like that, but I'm for the church. I love the church. But for me, the church is a fellowship. The church is not a philosophy. The church is not a culture. The church is not the enterprise. So I'm against when Christianity becomes a culture. I'm against the enterprise, but no, I'm not against the church. I'm not against pastors in the church, neither. Because it's not like they want to do many of the things they're doing, but they get changed when they start to come into that system and I'm going to share something from my own life. So I'm not against the pastor, I'm not against the church, I'm for the church and I'm for the pastors. I want to set them free. I want to set them free from that system so they again start to make disciples as Jesus have called them to instead of just making church goers. So I'm not against things and I want to say I've been speaking many church, I was just in Church of England speaking and, and many places I've been speaking about some of the things I'm sharing here. And it somehow go against what they're doing. But almost every place I am, I get invited back. Almost every place I am, I get one or two more invitations. Why? Because people love it. And because they want the freedom and they see that this is worth it working and this is the word of God. So I want to say that I'm for things, I'm for the church, I'm not against the church and um, and yeah, this is just what I want to say. I want to pray because we need the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit is not working and revealing this truth, we can speak and speak and speak and nothing is happening. We need to see the Holy Spirit is working. So I will start to pray. God, I thank you for this message here. I thank you for the next, next lessons where we are to, going to look at the church structure, God, where we are going to look at the last reformation and what you are doing, God. God, I pray that you give me wisdom to speak this word. And I pray for everybody who's seen this, that you open their ears, their eyes, their hearts, God, so they can receive everything you have for them, God. Jesus, thank you because you are building your church. And thank you, Jesus, because we can be part of that. 
We want to be part of what you are doing. So come with your Holy Spirit today and help me to share this word and open the eyes of everybody who's seen this video. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, I want to tell, I want to start with telling a testimony. Some of you have heard that testimony. I just made a new video where I spoke about it. But a few days ago, it's like four days ago, here in Denmark, I had a strong experience one more time. And I really love what happened a few days ago here in Denmark because it shows what Jesus wants to do and what we are longing for. Because we saw everything somehow go together when we come to the power of God, when we come to being led by the Holy Spirit, when we come to, to Jesus building his church. A few days ago, I was out to have a meeting. Before the meeting, I just went out praying. And I was walking and praying just before the meeting. And I saw a bench where, bench where two persons were sitting and one had crosses. And I went there and the one with crosses could not lift the legs because he had been overrated like a half year before. And, I, and he will not be able to walk without cross a half year. And I pray for a person. And there, out before the meeting, God came. He already started. He got healed. And they were in shock. So I invited them to the meeting. And they came to the meeting. And the day after, we were out again where one of them came. And he had another boy with him, another friend with him. And they followed us out because they want to see the power of God. They want to experience more. And uh, we were out on the street there and a lot of things happened. Uh, one of the things that happened is that we have a family who came down from Norway who want to get kickstarted, who have seen the Pioneer School. And out on the street I saw a young guy who have, uh, and I talked with him, he had a disc problem. And one of the one from Norway, a guy 18 years old, he have never got kickstarted, never prayed for anybody before. I said, come here, lay your hands. And he laid the hands on the one with the, the, this problem. And he jumped back immediately because he felt something came into the disc. A pain shoot into the disc. And afterward, everything went away and he was healed. And he was like, what did you do? And he looked at the boy from Norway. What did you do? And, the, and he was like surprised himself. So he didn't know what to answer. But it didn't stop there. Something started there. And I can tell one of the stories that started is that the one, the boy with, with the disc, he contacted me the day after. And he came the day after with his father, his uncle and his cousin. And we met there because they also want to get prayed for. And they were from Bosnian. They were Orthodox but it was a culture for them. And uh, there God came. A lot of things happened. I started to pray for the father. He could not say exactly what happened right there. I prayed for the uncle. He got healed in the knee and he was standing like that. And he was speaking in his own language. So I could not understand what he was saying right there. But I could see he was healed. And afterward he, he told me in Danish, the, the, the Danish he had learned. And then I prayed for the cousin, and he had um, MS, multiple sclerosis, and he got set free from a demon. He fall down on the chair, and you can see that demon in his face, and, like, <laughs> and I was like, come out in the name of Jesus, and the demon left him. And he jumped up, gave me a kiss on the cheek, and cried, and was so happy, and smiled, and was really excited. Why? Because he have got delivered. And, the, the, and he felt a strength in his body again he had not done before. <laughs> and it was really strong for the rest of the family to see what happened there. But it didn't stop there. Suddenly God came with a revelation. God came with, the, I don't know how I can call it, the gift of prophecy or what. But suddenly I saw things I have not seen before. And it was so strong, so I just started to see things. So I started to prophesy over everybody. So I started with one. Hey, you are captain on a football. You have played football and you have been a captain. You have played there, 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 but captain is what you are. And I started to prophesy over him. And afterward, he was like, tears in his eyes. He said, how did you know? 
It's like you can look into me. How did you know I've been captain? I played football there and there. It's like you have just met me, but it's like you know me. You know everything about me. And it was so strong. And then the next, you don't have a job. You cannot find a job and start to prophesy over him. And the next and the next. And there God came and it was so beautiful. And I make a whole video on my website where I'm going to tell more details about it. And I encourage you to see that. But it was so strong, but it didn't stop there. Suddenly, God also spoke to, you know, God spoke to me also that a new group was going to start with their own language from Boston. And there the door opened and two persons came in. And I was like, who are you? Go out. I didn't know who they were. And they came in and started to speak with those people on their own language. And I could see that two was Christian. And, and they know each other. And I was like, what is happening here? I was a little confused. But then, then, one of the person told me something and it was really strong. She told me afterward what happened. What happened was one of the guys who came in was a football player on the Danish league. He was, he's a goalkeeper on a Danish league, the best league in Denmark. And a known man there. And he wanted to meet me because he heard I was in the city that day. So he met a friend I knew and said, can I come and talk to Torben? And he said, no, you cannot because he's busy. He's praying for people. And he was like, okay. And then he went to the car, but when he came to the car, he heard God speak to him because he's a born again Christian. He heard God speak, turn around, go in right now. So he turned around and went in and opened the door and came in. He had got told that he was not allowed to come in because I was busy. But God spoke to him and said something else. So he came in and he had a friend with her and with him. He was from Croatian. His friend was from Bosnia. And she knows those people I was praying for. And now you have to hear this. 20 years ago when she came to Denmark, she was on a refugee camp 20 years ago. And there on that refugee camp, she got to know those family, the daughter family, because they were together there. She was a Muslim at that time. Later, she got saved, born again, Christ, uh, born again. And she met them 10 years later, where the father I have just prayed for came to her and said, what is heaven with you? Something is heaven. What is this? And she, he could see something was changed in her and she could then tell him about Jesus. But they didn't have good contact with each other. So it was not like they, they know each other that way. But now you have to hear. Three weeks ago, God spoke to this woman and said, you have to pray for this family. So the last three weeks, she had been praying for that family that they were going to get saved. And then she came in the door just as I was finished praying for those people. And now she's going to follow up on, those, on that family and start a group on their own language. That's exactly what I experienced God spoke to me about. Can you see how beautiful this is? We have healing on the street, healing before me, healing on the street, discipleship on the street, church on the street. We have how God is leading. We went out. Because she had been praying the last three weeks for those family. God sent us out. I got in contact with the son. He got healed. Later I met the whole family. God spoke to this uh, goalkeeper. Go to Torben right now. He had told he was not allowed. But he went to me. And he had a friend with the friend who had been praying for those people. <laughs> and it's so beautiful here. Because there are so many details. It was like almost what I could tell from South Africa a short time ago. That you see, it's not only healing, it's not only prophesying and, and, uh, and the word of knowledge, it's, it's not only people are getting saved, it's not only being led by the Holy Spirit. No, it's everything come together. Everything come together. And this is what the church is. This is when Jesus is building, when Jesus is building his church. 
We are not led by programs. <laughs> we are led by the Spirit. And we will see again and again and again how everything comes together. And it's so beautiful. <laughs> it's so beautiful when Jesus is building his church. And I don't know what you want to be a part of. Do you want to be a part of a man who have a vision that he wants to have a church with 300 members and a worship group and uh, and you just come there and sit and send his vision and his church and then do church that way? Or do you want to be a part of Jesus' vision about reforming the church, about Jesus building his church? Do you want to be part of that? And I believe you want, of course, to be part of that. You want to be part of Jesus' church and the way he's doing things. And But sometimes... We have to choose. We cannot do everything at the same time. We need to see a reformation of the church. And the testimonies I'm experiencing again, 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 where everything comes together is because God has set us free from our religious, um, how can I say, view of what church is. And we now do not focus on my vision of church but on Jesus' vision of church. <laughs> it's not what I want, it's what Jesus wants. And he's building. And I want to be part of that. <laughs> because this is so more exciting. And I know that um, this is just the beginning. I want to tell about our journey. Uh, a little, very fast go through my journey. When it comes to getting change when it comes to church and then I will show you something up here. I got saved many years ago and I came like many other to uh I would call yeah you can see it looked like a church I have a small cross there. I came to a church a building and there was a platform and there was pews where I was sitting there on one of the pews and looking on the platform in the church building on a Sunday. And very, very fast, I adopted that mindset that this is church. I thought it was church. I thought what I was doing was church. But very fast or after a short time, something started in me, a frustration. And I know many of you also have that frustration. It was a frustration because I was... I don't want to just sit on the pew Sunday after Sunday and look at the platform. I also want to do more. I want to serve God. I want to speak. So I asked my youth leader, hey, how can, when, when is my turn? I also want to speak. And he looked at me and he said, Torben, you can help with the son, uh, kids and then you can help with Sunday school and, and you can be a youth leader after some years. And as a youth leader, Torben, you're going to speak one Sunday each year. So he started to explain to me how I could come and speak on the platform and how I could build slowly up through this system. And it would take me five years to get one Sunday each year. It was what he said to me. And there it was like God opened my eyes because suddenly I saw that many people who attend church there, they were spiritual dead. They were just attending church and doing nothing. And I saw like, whoa, what is happening here? If I'd stay here, I would be like them. And it ended up with that we left that church and moved to a new city to help with some church planning. And I want to, if I look at church today, I would divide the church in three groups. The first group is the smallest group. We have the group with 10%. This is the 10% who is serving God on the meetings, who's doing something. Is the speaker, the the meeting, leading the, the guy who lead the meeting, the worship group, the one who are active in the church. And if you are active and you give something, then you are happy. Yeah, because then you are growing. And this is what I've been saying to the Pioneer School. We grow, we learn by doing. If you do something, you learn, you grow, and therefore you are happy because... This is the longing everybody has. We want to grow. We want to get changed. We want to be used by God. 
But in a normal Sunday meeting, if we take a church here where there is 100 people, a normal Sunday meeting, there is only 10% out of those 100 people who's active. The 90%, the 90 people just come and do nothing. Come and watch, come and sit down and they do nothing. And this is so opposite what they did in the first church and what Jesus came with and what the first church was about. The church, first church was a living body where every member was functioning, was working. It was not only half of the arm who was working. No, the whole body was working. And when we talk about this system and church mean everything, it came from the Catholic Church and we have it all over the place today. But in the book of Acts, they did it very different. They met very more, they, they did church much more simple, just met small groups and just share Jesus. And the only liturgy, the only church meeting setup we have in the Bible is Paul, he's saying this. When you come together, each of you have, and then he's talking a hymn, a word of instruction, a revelation, and so on. And everything must be done so that the church may be built up. So he says, when you come together, each of you have something to share. It don't have to be exactly this, this, this. But he said, when you come together, each of you have something to share. But very slow in this way, you come to church, but you don't give anything because you are not allowed to give anything. <laughs> the church setting in, is not set up in a way so you are allowed to give, any, give something. But the Bible says when you come together, everybody has something to share. If you during the week know that next week and next week and next week and next week, you just go to church, but you don't but you should not give anything, then you became passive, very slow. Because if you don't give anything, there's, you, there's no reason to get filled up. If, for example, if I have a young boy and I want him to read the Bible more this week than he did last week and study the Word and grow more this week than he did last week, it's easy. I just say to him, you're going to speak next Sunday. And he was like, what? I, am I going to speak? Yes. If I say he's going to speak next Sunday, I guarantee you this week he's going to pray. He's going to eat the word of God. He's going to meditate on the word of God. And he's going to get changed by that. Why? Because he see the next Sunday is his turn. And that's why we need to create a platform that's more than this. A platform where everybody can get used by God, where everybody can give something. Because when you have a platform where you say give something, you keep close to God. It's like, I know that every week there is people who need teaching. Every week there is people who want prayer. There is needs all the time. Because I see the needs all the time, it keeps me close to God. Because I know I have to be ready all the time, 24-7. But this system somehow is not built for that. It's only 10% who serve and many slowly die spiritually. But before you die spiritually, you come into the other group. Are you not amongst the 10%? It's a big chance you are amongst the 30%. Who is the 30%? The 30% are the people who are frustrated. They want more. They don't just want to sit and watch. They, like me, I was frustrated at that time. I want more. When is my turn? Because God has also laid a calling inside of them. Not only the pastor, not only the people on the platform, but God has laid a calling inside each of us. And we are all called when we come together to give something. So they're frustrated. But you cannot continue being frustrated because it's going to kill you. <laughs> so you're going to do two things. You're going to do something radical and come up amongst the 10%. Or you're going to do like I did, leave the church. And there's 
million of people who's leaving the church system each year. Why? Not because they don't want God, but because they want God. They want more. And they have to leave the church because the place they are, they cannot see how they can come in and serve God. Like I did. And again, I know there's different churches. There is many, many, maybe you are coming in a church where it's not a problem, but many people know what I'm talking about. But many people have been frustrated. And after a time in frustration, they go into the biggest group and go down to the biggest group in the church, the 60%. Who is the 60%? I call the 60% the, the falling away group, the group that have fallen away. Remember to fall away is not to stop attending church. To fall away. A way is to leave the first love. Jesus said, Revelation, I have that against you that you have left the first love. <laughs> Repent. Falling away is to leave the first love. What they do after some time in frustration, if they cannot see how it ever can become anything, what God has laid inside of them, they just take the calling and just, it don't matter, just put it away. So they take their calling and put it away. Because they cannot continue being frustrated. And then they think, okay, I just attend church. And they, they, then they just attend church Sunday after Sunday. And slowly their life is dying. The spiritual life is dying. Their first love is gone. And the calling is buried. And they just attend church. And this is a dangerous place to be also. Where we are called to serve God. And because this is the most dangerous place to be is just attend church. Because so many million people are dying each year inside this system. It's taking away the fire. So I believe because of that also we need to change that system back to what Jesus came with, what Jesus did. Another good reason when it comes to this is that this is not able to bear fruit the way we want to bear fruit. Again and again and again, I have taken one person or two person in a small group and discipled them. And I have seen them grow. I can take one person, disciple him, and next year he has seen two people saved. I've done that many times. It's, it's not a big problem if we use the tools God has given us to see two people saved, baptized in water and Holy Spirit in one year. But if I take one person do that, I have a growth called 200%. And I can do that again and again and again when it comes to discipleship. But how often do you see a church where there's 100 members this year? Year 1, there's 100 members. Year 2, there's 200. Then there's 400, 800, 600. This is a growth of 100%. But how often do we see that? We don't see that. Why? Because this system is not able to create disciples. It only creates churchgoers. And instead of everybody bearing fruit in the everyday life, just become like, instead of multiplication, it's like added a few people here. So it's 100 people and then it's 110 and 118 and maybe 115 and then 130. And it goes like this. There is no multiplication. But Jesus, the Bible, have called us to bear fruit. As the Father have sent me, I send you, Jesus said, go out and bear much fruit. Every body of us should bear fruit. It's not enough to come in a church and say, hey, there's three people who got saved last year, so there was a few people who somehow. What about you? Every one of us, each one of us is called to bear fruit. And if we want to do the mission Jesus has called us to, we need to change our way of doing. He has called us to disciple nations. He has not called us to make small churches grow a little here and there. He has called us to impact the whole world. And we don't do that this way. We do it in another way. And I will read a little from my book, The Last Reformation. 
Welcome. Uh, I have a chapter where I talk about churches that we need many new churches. And often, if I say to you, "Do you want to start a church?" in our, our normal mindset, no, no, I don't want to. Why? Because it, 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 it is hard to start a church. We need a church building. We need a committee. We need money. We need uh, a lot of hands. We need a lot of things. So it's difficult. It's difficult to start a church like this. But if we go back to the simple way the church was in the Book of Acts, and you know what they're doing, and I ask you, do you want to start that? Then yes, of course. Everybody can be part of that. It's much easier, much more simple. And if you are past, I want to ask you, what do you want to see? Do you want to start one church with 1,000 members? Or what about starting 1,000 churches with 10, 15 members instead? What do we want? Do we want to change the world? Or do we just want to do churchgoers? And I believe when we talk about this, I know so many pastors who are my friends, who, like me one time, start a church with one goal, I want to make disciples. And this is the reason you start church or you become a pastor. You love God, you love people, you want to make disciples. But what happened? You started in a good way, but somehow this way of thinking changed. And I did that, you come into a box and you did it in a way that after a short time you saw that you didn't make disciples anymore. No, you just at uh, you just yeah have church goer who was attending church. And I see that the leaders, their hearts is good, and many want to really serve God, but because of our religious view on church, we are not able to break through. We are not able to break through when it comes to discipleship. And when I have got my glasses off, <laughs> the fruits are so different. But I don't know if you know, but we can use a lot of time working on the kingdom of God. And we can think we are doing a good thing, but what we are actually do is we are hindering the word of God. I can come with a uh, a strong experience I had some years ago. I'm part of a network with simple churches. And I was in uh, Sweden a short time ago where we met our apostle, a church planner in India, uh, from India. He has started a network in India where in India they have baptized 5 million people in 10 years. 5 million people in 10 years. And it's not often what we hear about when we see of the mega churches. We look at the mega church in America, whoa, look, there are 10,000 people, whoa. And we read their books. But here we talk about 5 million people in 10 years and not 10,000 people in 10 years. Why? Multiplication. Multiplication is all about spreading out instead of gathering. Is spreading out, making the servants, sending out. But this guy who has started that network, he said something I'm never going to forget. He said that a few years ago, there came a big church organization from America who wanted to help, help with what God was doing in India. So they came with a lot of man hours, a lot of money. They came with a lot of money. They came with a lot of dollars to put into this work. But after a few years, they stopped again. And this man who has done that network, he looked with me with tears in his eyes and he said, yeah, is if that church organization have not come here to help build the church of God, we have not baptized 5 million at this time, but 8 million. Because when they came, the natural growth stopped or got slower. And it's so interesting when you think of this. Here we have our organization 
in good faith want to build a church of God. They are using thousands of hours doing that. They are using millions of dollars doing that. But the end result is minus three million souls. So the absolute best they could have done for the kingdom of God was to do nothing. I want to say that again. The absolute best they could have done for the kingdom of God was to do nothing. Was to not use their money, not use their hours of building the kingdom of God because they hindered the natural growth. The church of God is a body, is a living body, and it grow natural if we just let it grow. But many today do the same. The way we do church hinder the natural growth. We just need to let go and then it will grow natural. The seed is in the ground and it will grow because there is power in the seed. And I want to say when it comes to reason the world, it grow a lot here. It grow a lot of places where there is persecution. Why? Because the places there is persecution. Under persecution, the system is going to fall down. This is the first thing that's going to happen. The churches are going to close. The pastor is thrown in the jail. And suddenly they cannot come and meet anymore as they used to. And what happened? It's growing. It's growing like never before. And so interesting when you think of this, that what much of what we are doing today don't produce fruits. It hinder growth. And I can say it, I'm part of that. I have been part of that. I've been working church planning three different towns, 14 years. And um, I've done the same. I've been part of that. But now look at the testimony. See, we are seeing a growth that is exploding all over the world. Why? Because we are making disciples instead. We have changed the way we do church. I want to read from a book. I have a chapter, a lot of new churches. When we talk about churches, to make a church like this is not easy. Because it costs a lot of money. It create, you need a lot of people to just start. And it's not easy. And because of that, we don't see new churches so much today. And I have here a quote from a, something called Dawn, Disciple a Whole Nation. This is a network. Jesus called us to disciple a whole nation. And Dawn, they have been working with strategy planning of fellowships. And they say that the optimal way to accomplish the great commission as Jesus gave us is to have a new fellowship for every 500 to 1,000 people. For every, for every 500 to 1,000 people that need a fellowship. Why? Because out of working with churches, a church, a normal sized church, this is how many people they influence a normal sized church. So if you take a city of Denmark, normal sized city, 30,000 people are living in that. That with 30,000 people in Denmark normally have two, three, four churches, not more. Those cities who have two, three churches, four churches, should have at least 30, 40, 50, 60 churches more to do what Jesus have called us to and obey the great commission. But today it's like, no, we have one Baptist church in that city and one Pentecost church and not more and one Lutheran church. Come on, if we want to reach the whole nations and do what Jesus have called us to, disciple whole nation, not only a few people here and there, we need to change our way of doing church. 
And a good thing with many churches, and a good thing with doing the church the way Jesus do it, is that there we don't have to have 10%, 30%, and 60%. No, there we can have 100%. Because in Jesus' vision, there is work enough for everybody of us. In Jesus' way of doing things, and this is what we're going to look at the next time and next two times, you will see that there is room for everybody of us. Okay, back to my story. I left this and I moved to a new church, a new city to start a church. And there we wanted to do things different. We wanted to make disciples. So how did we do it? Our first meeting, and I was like, how do we do it? You lead the meeting. I'm going to speak. Yes, but we also need to take up our offer. Yeah, but what if I say welcome, then we have two songs, then we take up our offer, then we have three songs, and then you speak and we have communing. Yes, let's do that. And it's so interesting because I left something because I don't want to be like this. I want to make disciples. I went to a new city to do church. But it was not different. What I ended up with what was exactly what I don't want. I didn't want to just do church. I wanted to make disciples and I ended up exactly with the same I came from. And this is what you have to understand. It's not easy to take that, to get that system out of you. I have people who have bought the last reformation in the book who have read it 10 times. And each time, they are more and more free, like something is leaving them. And in the end, they are totally free. Because it's not easy to get this system out of you. And I encourage you to get the book on Amazon, The Last Reformation, read it. But I was in that city, and to be honest, I didn't bear fruit. It, it didn't grow. It was not amazing. I didn't have a lot of strong testimonies. So after a short time, I moved to a new city with a new friend to start a new church there. And there something happened because we started in our living room. And for the first time, it was like, it was like the glasses came off a little, like I could see over the glasses. And there I got a taste of something that changed my life forever. I got a taste what church is. Because there, I could say for the first time, we are not just member coming in the same church. We are family. We love each other. When we came together, everybody had something to share. Everybody was growing and it was growing. And first time I got a taste mm, of what church was. But I didn't have the glasses off me. So short time after we became too many and we got the church meeting and we got the pews and the frustration came and it became exactly like the same one more time. And frustration came and a lot of things happened. Then I moved to a new town again, my, me and my family. And there we started a new church again because our heart is church, church planning, build, start churches. And there I started somehow good, but very short after, I was there again. And one thing that made me even more worse than I've done before, than I have been before, is that the other two church plans I've been in, I was not the pastor, I was one of the leaders, I was the evangelist, I was not the top of the pyramid. So the whole pressure was not on me. I was more free, but this time I became the pastor. And suddenly I heard the, how many are you in your church? And I experienced a pressure upon me and people said, you cannot start church. You are evangelist. You cannot do that. You cannot do that. And there was a big, big pressure upon me to produce, to show that I was a good leader. So I started to change. I, I got the glasses off on me. And I became a pastor and I started to do a lot of things I didn't want. Hey, don't be with that church. You are with me. You are not with them. And the church was divided and I started to compete against the other churches. Because my people, I will show them that I was a good leader. And I started to control people. And I needed that money because 
it was part of my salary and everything and the house and 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 I started to do something I should not do. I was somehow I, I was manipulating people. It was not because I wanted, it was not because it was my heart, but now, now when I'm out of that, I look back, I can see, whoa. I start to control people, not because I was evil in my heart and want to destroy them, but because I want to see them succeed. I want so much that they should grow up, so much that I took over where the Holy Spirit should have done it. And I saw that suddenly I was trying to build a, no, don't, hey, read this, read this. You had, I wanted so much to succeed because I was building my kingdom and I want people to show, see that I was a good leader and I want them to succeed so much. But I saw in the end that the result was bad. I make a people depend on me instead of, of God. I took over where the Holy Spirit should have been working. And I, I talk about that in my book. And I became, like many pastors out there, there is a spiritual system that's going to kill that life. Suddenly you read the Bible not to know Jesus, but to have a new sermon. Suddenly you do things because, yeah, you be become dependent on their money and so on and so on and, and all of that produce things you don't want to. And when you are in it, it's not always so easy to see it, but when you're out of it, you're like, what have I done? And, and, and if I look back, that period where I was leader there, I don't have so much good fruit of my work. My heart was good in many ways. I did uh, out of... yeah. My, my heart was to serve God, but my classes, my way of doing things, the system hindered me in bearing fruit. But then God gave me a dream. In the dream, I saw two men, who, a person who was standing beside me smoking. And one gave me the cigarette and said, you have to smoke. And I said, no, I don't want to smoke. You have to smoke. I don't want to smoke. You have to smoke. If you don't smoke, people are going to see that we are smoking. And I took the cigarette in the dream and I was smoking. And I feel the smoke. And I mean, i like, no, what have I done? What I have done? And I woke up and I knew exactly what I have done. The two persons was the two cities we have been in before, the two churches we have started. The smoke was the system, a system that's going to kill the life, that killed the body. And I knew exactly where I was smoking because God, when I started the third church here, God said to me in the beginning, trust me, trust me, don't go under the system one more time. Don't be so hurried to say, now we are start a church and you are pastor. Don't do what other people expect of you. But I didn't trust him. So I came under the system one more time because I was afraid what other people would think of me. And there I took the cigarette and I smoked. And it killed the body. And when God gave me that dream, I repented. And I closed down the church. And then we moved to this city. And since that I have been free <laughs> from the system. And we are building with churches today. We are starting many churches. We are helping other churches. We are, I'm speaking on a conference, church planning conference. And we see a growth that is exploding like never before. And I have made, I, I've been, and it's so interesting because the system, you can be in a church and still be free. I've been speaking in a church of England, but I was more free now in, I've experienced many other places. I've been in many churches to share that and I experience our freedom. But I've also met many pastors who are free and wanted this, but they have a leadership who didn't want that, who was afraid to lose, who didn't trust the Holy Spirit. <laughs> And this is so different from person to person. But I want to say 
the freedom is so exciting and the way people are growing now is explosive. You cannot see if a church is good out of how many members there is, how, uh, how big the economy is. No. Do people follow Christ? Do people live as disciples in everyday life, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday? Do they obey Jesus in what he has commanded? If they do, it's good. If you don't do, you don't have what call a church. This is not church. Church is disciples who follow Jesus. But it was my journey, a little of my journey. I want to say, for me, it took me 14 years, three church planning to get this off me. What I got in the first month, it took me 14 years and three church planning to get off. And we are really focused on not going back again because it's so easy to come back under that one more time. So this is how our focus now. Keep out here, work here, do this. And we are really focused on that because we love the freedom and we want to keep the freedom. I want to continue now and talk about uh, multiplication and the simple church and what, what, what the most simple thing is when it comes to church and talk a little about the system. Uh, very short and then I'm going to end and then we are going to continue next time where we are going to look at what Jesus did. I want to read two things because in the Bible there is the great commandment. The great commandment you read about in Matthew 22, and somebody asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment, most important commandment? And Jesus said, you must lo love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. So the first and greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. But there is a second that is equal with that. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus said the entire law and all the demands of the prophet are based on those two commandments. So we have the great commandment. And then we have the great commission in Matthew 28. The great commission. I have been given all authority in heaven and earth. Jesus said, and there, go therefore, make disciples of the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So this is the great commandment. If we should look at church and do it as simple as possible, I have made this. The first thing Jesus said is love God. Love your God with everything in us. We are called to love God. The next thing he has said is to love your neighbor. And it's really important in that we start with loving God because if you do not have the love God with part with you and only love your neighbor, it became a humanistic love. No, we have to love God first. And you cannot love God if you really don't know him. And it's by the Holy Spirit that love is poured out in your heart. Something I've been talking about. And then we are able to love people not with a humanistic love, but with a true love. A love where we tell the truth so people can set, be set free. So love is not a humanistic love. So we love God, love your neighbor, and make disciples. I want to look here. Make disciples. It's so important. Love God, love your neighbor, and make disciples of all nations. This is church. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered, I'm in the middle of you. This is the most simple form of church. We are together with people. We love God. We love our neighbor. We love other people. And we make disciples. This is church. What I did last week, a few days ago, where I was out here in Denmark, and people got healed and safe and kickstarted and trained. This is church. This is church. But the problem is that we put, we've put this in a box. And it came with a Catholic church. And that box somehow hinders our love for God, our love for people, 
and hindrer us in making disciples. And to show that box, I have some tape here I want to put up. This is the box we often take and put over things. And what this box, what is that? The first thing is the building. We think that to be a church is necessary to have a building. But it's not necessary to have a building. Look at the first Christian, the first really church, really church building came during that time. The first church grow amazing, explosive without a church building. Look at the places we have growth today. The persecution country is where there is the most growth and there they didn't, don't have the church building the way we have it. And often we read the Bible wrong because everything we, th we, 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 we read the Bible with our glasses. For example, if I read this from Book of Acts 2, 47. Every day they, they came together in the temple court. They broke their bro bread in their homes and eat together and was glad and sincere of hearts. This is Acts 2, 47. Many of you have heard that. They came together in the temple court and at home they eat and broke the bread. Many churches is teaching, yeah, look, they came in the temple in the temple and then they meet in the houses this is the cell groups no 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 <laughs> the temple the temple here was not the meeting the meeting the fellowship was in the house where did they break the bread they bread the bread not in the temple in the house in the house was the meeting for the believers what is the temple then the temple was in Jerusalem when they came to other cities, they didn't build a new temple. No, the temple was already there, but Jesus came with something new. And when they came in the temple, it was not the way where they worshiped people. The temple court was where they evangelized, where they talked with people, where they prayed for people. And the lame man got healed. Peter stand up in Solomon's area and preached the gospel. The temple was where the people were. It's like, again, Paul, when he came to the synagogue, it was not like it was church. It was where he came. He preached radical as long as he could preach. It was okay. Sometimes they want to stone him. Other times they didn't want to hear him. But some few people followed him and he took them away with him to the homes. So the temple was not the place of worship. The temple was a place in Jerusalem and every other city they went to and other country, it was not like they built a new temple. No, there they just made in the homes and made, made out on the street. The temple was where the people were. It's like we meet today as a marketplace. We go out, are together, talk about Jesus, share the gospel and people get saved and then we go home and eat have communion, have fellowship, and then we go out again and new people get saved and go home and have fellowship. It was how the first church did. The first church didn't have a place the way we have it for a meeting. The next thing is staff. When you have to have a church, you also have to have staff. And staff, the problem with staff is that there's somebody who get paid for it, somebody who do it, and then there's us who do nothing. We are all called for the work of the kingdom. We are all staff in the kingdom of God. You are called, I'm called. There is nobody with only a few professional people. This is a body where everybody are called to work. And this is the problem the whole way we are set church up today. I can do it very short. In the Bible, there was a minister, the fivefold ministry who was laying a foundation. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, teacher. You can remember that way. 
The apostle, he was in and out very fast. I take a car to the next city. <laughs> he was together with the prophet who was pointing the way you have seen in your life and this is the direction we have to go. Those two was working together like a gun and laying the foundation. Then there was the evangelist. He was out. He was longer out in the order. He was the ling- longest finger. Then we had the shepherd. He was the one who was married to the fellowship and was helping and, 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 and continuing there no matter what happened. And then there was the smallest one. He was the teacher. He was the one who was taking things out of their ears so they could hear what he was saying. Those ministries in the first church was traveling from house to house, from place to place, and equipping and helping. And every small place have elders, not one, but more. And they were traveling and helping and connect, co- connecting those fellowship with each other. So they were there to equip the same to do the ministry, to make disciples. But today, those ministries have become staff, have become something they are not. They were only to make a foundation. You don't go to a church today and see, say, oh, what a nice foundation this church are, is. You don't see the foundation, you see the building. But it's so interesting with this because during the Reformation, the teacher gift has completely taken over and destroyed everything in many ways. Because the teacher, many ways, have teach that the prophet, you know, the apostle and the prophet is not today. They are gone. There is church who believe that there is no prophet and no apostles today. They are gone. And this is the teacher who said that, but you don't find that in the Bible. <laughs> but he have also teach that the shepherd and the teacher is one gift. So who's left? The evangelist. He don't want to be part of that, so he's thrown out. So suddenly, instead of five full ministry, we have one gift, teaching. And everything today is about teaching. We just think if we have enough teaching, we are going to obey Jesus. No. We need every gift together to work together for us to come in and obey Jesus and do what he has commanded us. So we need to see that we are all members. We, we are, when it comes to staff, you are called. There is nobody who are more called in other people to serve. But I'm going through that very fast and then I'm going to give you a lot of tools the next time. Another thing is the program. We run the program. And everything has to be in program. Everything has to be in the building. Everything has to be the same. I heard people who want to give out tracks, want to go out on a str- church to you know, out on the street to evangelize, but they are told, no, you cannot do that because in our church, our vision, we don't do that. And many people are hindered in their love for God, their love for the neighbor, hindered in making disciples. Why? Because everything has to be the same. We have to run our program. If non-believers come in and want to get saved, we still have to run our program. Instead of just sitting down with them and share the gospel and see them get saved. And it's like everything somehow is the same. No matter what church you come to, everything looks the same and I don't like it. Because he didn't come with it. I heard a church who want more of the Holy Spirit. So they put like 10 minutes into their program where the Holy Spirit could work. But the Holy Spirit don't work like that. And then the last thing, budget. Because a building staff costs money. And then we need to have a budget. And the problem with the budget is that everything end up as an enterprise. The church building is often the biggest problem. This is where it starts. And then we have the staff and then the program and we have the budget. And the living body who will grow natural become a new system. It ends up as an enterprise. And with money, with a budget, we start to talk about, you have to tithe in the church, you have to do that. When you talk about tithing, very short. I have a chapter in my book here. I, I, I think it's okay to give, but look here. Have you heard Malachi chapter 3 that we are robbing God if you don't give your whole tithe? And I believe many have heard that. Have you heard the Bible also sometimes say that you should eat your own tithe? You read it in the Bible here. Have you heard another place say that 
Uh, sometimes you should not bring the tithe, but you should keep the tithe at home so other people could come and take of it. <laughs> there is so many rules about tithe, and I believe that everybody who have read the, read the Bible know what the Bible is saying. They know that this is not biblical with giving 10% to a building, that you have to do it as a rule. But many create a rule. Why? Because of budget. Many start to control people and manipulate people. Why? Because of money. Because of budget. And I have been there in many areas. Not as bad as, as many is today. But what many people end up doing is that the building creates something, they create something, they create something, and we end up with something that is so different from what the word came with, what Jesus came with. And I'm going to end now because time has gone. So I want to say it don't have to be bad. I know people who have a church where there is a freedom, who don't manipulate with money, who don't have a place where everybody can work. But the problem is that it's really difficult. And next time we're going to look at what did Jesus really say? What did Jesus say or what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do today when it comes to church planting? And we are going to look at that next time. I remember there was some years ago we had that what would Jesus do? <laughs> what would Jesus do? Jesus will not have a building, have a staff, have a program, have a budget the way we do church. He will look at the simple thing, love God, love your neighbor and make disciples. So what I'm going to do is next time I'm going to look at Luke 10. And next time again, I'm going to look at Luke 10 where I become more practical. And there we will see what did Jesus really say and what will Jesus do today. And we will try to come out of this box and focus on what church really are and help you to make disciples and see a movement start all over the place. And I believe that in my whole heart. Because if we work the way Jesus called us to, everything is going to go together and everything will be so amazing. I'm going to pray and then my wife Lainey is going to sing a song. Jesus, thank you because you're going to take off our class and you're going to help us. Help us to be part of what you're doing. Help us to see that. Take our glasses off, Jesus. I pray for everybody who's seen this video that you are starting a reformation in their life in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, I'm going to stop now. The time has gone. I want to say again, you can get this on Amazon, The Last Reformation. I encourage you to get this book, to read it, uh, because it will help you also to uh, understand some of this I've been sharing and some of our journey. And then uh, next time, it's going to go some weeks because I'm going to America. I'm going to Phoenix, Arizona. Then I'm going to Las Vegas. I'm going to Los Angeles. And we're going to go out and train and equip in America and see God do amazing things. So next time, I have a lot of amazing testimonies to share to you what God has done in America. So I encourage you to see this video, see it again and again, and let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Start to think, what is church? Why do we do what we are doing? And slowly help you to be free from some of this and be the church God has called you to. God bless you.